Well, good morning, afternoon, evening, whenever it is that you are watching this video. I'm glad that you've taken the time to join us as we study another section of Matthew's Gospel. Talked a little bit about um, the passage that we were headed to last week um, in discussing why I chose to divide the passage the way that I did. Um, today's passage, verses 13 through 28 of Matthew's Gospel, are the hinge verses. This is where everything pivots. Um, it's not that um, the nature of Jesus changes after this moment. It's that um, his purpose is more and more revealed to his disciples and to others, and you get this tension between um, messianic hope and messianic reality. And that gap is part of what causes problems for um, early Jewish Christians following Jesus who are constantly reminded that Jesus as Messiah did not accomplish what they had hoped and what they had often heard the Messiah was going to accomplish and have to be reminded why Jesus did what he did, why they should still hold on to that hope, why it's worth following Jesus over um, returning back to um, a, a faith without um, Jesus at the center of it. So all of those things are important. The location where this takes place is highly symbolic and very important. Peter's words and, and then the gap between Peter's profession and Peter's understanding, all of those things are so important for us to take the time to look at and understand both in um, Peter's context and in our own. And I am at this moment very nervous that I do not have the microphone on. I do have the microphone on. Whoo! I, I realized that I made this mistake last week, and I did not want to make that mistake again. I am, however, going to change microphones so that I can um, kind of focus on this mic that is, at this moment, better located and more important. So that will actually be an interesting audio test to see which of these works better in my office. All right, that's a huge sidetrack. My bad. Um, so we, we get this gap between... Um, what many expected the Messiah to accomplish and the reality of what the Messiah was going to, was purposed for, and then indeed did accomplish. And, and I think that's one of those points just before we dive in that we can understand when we hope for one thing and the reality is different, even if the reality is good, it's hard to put those hopes, dreams, expectations that we carried with us to rest. Um, and so the early church struggles with that. I think in a lot of ways we continue to struggle with that because very often what we want Jesus to be and what we think then the church should be is some sort of um, political or cultural reformer. If um, the, the Jewish expectations around the Messiah um, before and during the time of Jesus was for somebody who would boot out the Romans and restore um you know, Jewish sovereignty over the state and, and, you know, let them kind of take that place in the world, then I, I think um, that's a trap that modern, especially American Christianity, falls into. And it's not just present here. It, there's a, uh, some of that, that that holds true, I think, a lot of different places, but I think it has been um, an incredibly enticing offer for much of American Christianity um, this notion that what Jesus is supposed to do is make our country, I don't know, better, more Christian, whatever we want to phrase it like that. Um, and that's not the goal. Um, Jesus is not a political reformer. He's a life changer. Um, he's a redeemer and a rescuer. And it's difficult to separate those two when what we want is one thing and what we get is the other. And Peter is going to deal with some of that in these passages. So, before I talk too much more, let's go ahead and dive into the text, Matthew chapter 16. And I'm going to break it down into two um, sections, same way that most of your Bibles do. Peter's declaration and then um, Peter's rebuke. And I don't think it's accidental that we have these two things sandwiched together, even though these stories likely take place some time apart from each other. It is important for us to understand the difference. And so Matthew, in recording this gospel, puts them right there together for us. So first, Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. 
When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do the people say the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then he asked, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of Jonah, or Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all of the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. And then he sternly warned his disciples not to tell anyone he was the Messiah. Which seems like a strange ending, especially given that Jesus has just celebrated that Peter has said it. Like, yay for saying it. Now don't do that again. Um, but there's a number of important points in these verses worth paying attention to for us. First, um, there is this recognition that people see something in Jesus. So when Jesus asks his disciples, what are the people saying? It's not because Jesus somehow needs that information. It's to get them processing out loud and relaying to us now, removed from this moment, what people thought of Jesus. And they all point to these incredibly important figures in the Old Testament um, or in, in, you know, Jesus' day who have at this point recently been put to death. You know, some are arguing that he is John the Baptist. John had been this incredibly important figure. And while we understand John's purpose one way, um, while John understood his purpose one way, the people didn't necessarily see or understand that. And so they see in Jesus much of what they saw in John the Baptist, this teacher, this guide, this voice in the desert um, that threw back to the prophets of old, which then makes sense that the other people that they name off here are prophets of incredibly important in the Jewish tradition. Um, some say Elijah, others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets is this recognition that in Jesus they see the voice and the authority being a very important word in Matthew's gospel the authority of God the voice of God the work of God that doesn't mean they understand exactly what Jesus is doing but they can see that God is doing something through Jesus and all they have to compare it to are the prophets um it's also, I think, uh, an important moment to point out that in Jewish apocalyptic literature, like Ezekiel has tones of that, Daniel has tones of that, other writings that are not in um, modern Protestant Bibles but exist in um, Jesus' day as Jewish writings and then have made their way into a more orthodox or uh, Catholic um, circles, uh, like the book of Exodus contains these ideas, ideas that Jesus' disciples and Matthew's early audience would have been very familiar with. Um, I, I want to say that Jesus quotes from either, yeah, Jesus quotes from Tobit at one point. Um, the, those are important, like, prophetic writings and voices. Those all suggest that when the Messiah comes, he's going to be joined or recognized by other prophets who show up at the same time. Um, there is this hope and dream of a renewal and a revival that's rooted in the power of God that I don't think people could understand outside of placing it in the context of the prophets who very much called for and challenged the people of their day to respond and renew and hope for um, the power of God in, you know, in a Messiah, in a rescuer, in a, in a redeemer. And so the people see that. And so they see not only that Jesus is like one of those, but that Jesus may be a forerunner to something special, something new, something powerful, something messianic. So the disciples let Jesus know, hey, here's what people are seeing. They see in you this prophet, and that lets us know as well. But then Jesus follows up that with, what about you? Who do you say that 
And Peter, very often in Matthew's gospel, is like the spokesman for the disciples. It's not just Peter messing up. It's Peter being representative of the disciples in general. I think, and I didn't say this when we did the, the video on it, but when Peter steps out of the boat, not only is it Peter as a person, but it's the disciples in general who are taking that step, right? They've chosen to follow, so there they are. When Peter opens his mouth, we see the thought process of the disciples as well. And so here Peter, as the one who seems to be most likely to say something, says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus pronounces this blessing on Simon, who then receives a name change, Petra, Peter, Rock. Um, and then this statement, and upon this rock, I will build my church. And people have been trying to figure out exactly what Jesus meant by that, because it is symbolic. The name is symbolic. The image is symbolic. The blessing is symbolic. The declaration is symbolic. Important for the early church community. And some take that statement to be about Peter, and some take that statement to be about Peter's declaration, and I'm not sure you can separate um, the two fully. Um, but I do think what we are supposed to understand here is that the, the foundation of the church is laid on a Messiah, the promised Messiah, who is not going to function the way that people expect him to function. Um, the the, the Jesus' statement here is not that the church is going to be built on people's understandings of the prophecies of old. It's not an assurance of the fulfillment of the promise in the way that the people understand. It's that, um, as Messiah, it is Jesus who we are following. And now we've got to figure out what that looks like. And here we get this, I think, recognition that knowing that Jesus is the Messiah and knowing what Jesus' purpose is are not the same thing. Because Peter makes this declaration. He makes the statement of hope. He is um, encouraged by Jesus in the process to see Jesus that way, but then is immediately told, along with the other disciples, not to share it. And I think that's because, I, I say this with a lot of certainty, that the disciples... Peter being, you know, the, the voice that gives this, uh, um, it makes this statement. But the disciples in general have a lot of confidence that they are following the Messiah, but they have no idea what that means. And until they understand who Jesus is, then they're not necessarily the best bearers of a message about Jesus as Messiah. Because they're not going to be able to well communicate Jesus' purpose. Jesus' um, importance, Jesus' role. Um, they can identify Jesus as the Son of God, but they cannot yet identify what that means. And in order to illustrate this, we get the next passage, verses 21 through 28. Starts with the phrase, oh, no, 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 I need to go back. I, 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 it's also important where the previous passage takes place, and I failed to talk about that, so I'll try and do this in like two seconds. Caesarea of Philippi, um, not overly Jewish territory. I've been talking about the importance of the Gentiles and Gentile inclusion. Um, throughout the book of Matthew, we've got somebody else, a Gentile, who first makes the statement that Jesus is the Son of God. The disciples come to understand that, not in Jerusalem, but in Caesarea of Philippi. Caesarea of Philippi, at the time of Jesus, probably, you know, within eyesight of where Jesus and his disciples had this conversation, um, has this very important temple to Pan. Um, and before that moment in the Old Testament had been a very historic and important place for the worship of one of the Baals. Um, so it is um, this realization, this statement from Peter, this declaration does not occur in a traditional location, but occurs outside. Um, and I don't think we're supposed to miss that. Um, because an understanding of Jesus as Messiah inevitably takes you outside the tradition. Jesus is not going to be a temple leader. Jesus is not going to lead a revolution from the summit of Zion. 
Um, and those are kind of the hopes and dreams and expectations of many of the people at the time of Jesus. But here Jesus is not only away from the temple, but outside of a dominant Jewish area and in the shadow of, um, uh, of, of you know, other gods. And maybe that's the important image um, because it's very easy. And I think Peter's going to do this at least partially here in the next passage. It's very easy to turn what we want Jesus to be into an idol and to create Jesus in our own image. Here's who I think Jesus is. Therefore, that is what Jesus is. Or here's what I want Jesus to accomplish. Therefore, that's what Jesus wants to accomplish. Um, and inside a traditional understanding, um, you can miss some of those points. Jesus takes them to a place of discomfort, which I think is important because following Jesus as Jesus is, is going to get pretty uncomfortable for them. All right, verse 21. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hand of the elders, the leading priests, the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but on the third day he would raise from the dead. So first, from that time on. That's not the same as saying then. So it's not what immediately happens next. Jesus begins to reveal more and more of his actual purpose, actual mission, actual path. And I don't think it happens the first time Jesus says it, or the second, or the third. But as disciples begin to hear Jesus repeat himself often, that suffering and death are in his future, um, I think it probably is pretty hard to hear the resurrection part because they don't have a lot of context for understanding that. Instead, what they have is doom and gloom um, pr predictions versus uh, a coronation. Where Jesus isn't saying, we're going to go to Jerusalem and be crowned and we're going to get this awesome throne room and we're going to defeat our enemies and God is going to restore our place on the earth. Jesus says, we're going to experience rejection and suffering and I'm going to die. Um, so eventually, Peter pulls him aside at verse 22 Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, this will never happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. And then maybe the most important line in this passage, and maybe in Matthew's gospel, you are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. And then Jesus turned to his disciples. And this illustrates, I think, that statement that Jesus just made. You're seeing things from a human point of view, not God's. He turns to his disciples and says, if any of you wants to be my follower, which I think just pausing there has to be somewhat hurtful because they would think we are followers. We are following you. Um, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? For the Son of Man will come with his angels in the glory of his Father and will judge all people according to their deeds. And I tell you the truth, some standing here will not die before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. I'm setting... The last verse aside is one that has been incredibly difficult to explain, and I'm not going to attempt to wade through all of the possible meanings and what Jesus might have been saying or um, not saying. We have the rest of this passage, which is imminently more applicable to us, because I think it's very easy for us to fall into the same trap as Peter, where we have this understanding of what we want Jesus to be, um, what we think Jesus should accomplish, and how we think Jesus should do it. And very often that stands in contrast to who Jesus actually is, what Jesus is actually accomplishing, and how Jesus is going to accomplish it. And so we get this, this recognition that not only does that gap exist, but that as people, we are very tempted to pursue it to our own end. 
But then we have to have the other side of this conversation where we recognize that doing those things is a temptation to Jesus, right? Because what Peter voices is concerned that Jesus isn't going to do what Peter and the disciples and the early Jewish community, all those who hope for Messiah, want Jesus to do. And I think there has to be this recognition because it's basically the same temptation that Satan offers in chapter 4 that that is in fact tempting for Jesus because it is certainly less painful and it is definitely more powerful. Um, and it is tempting to usurp authority and avoid the cross and suffering and not have to sacrifice and set the world the way that you want it as opposed to suffering for the world and inviting them to follow with the understanding that many won't. Um, and so what... Peter offers here is in fact a temptation, which is why Jesus' response is so strong. Um, in fact, what Jesus says to Peter is essentially what Jesus says to Satan in uh, the temptation story in chapter 4. Uh, and then Jesus makes clear to his disciples that the path they walk with him is not one that leads to a throne room. Um, it is one that inevitably involves suffering and sacrifice and definitely in no way does it move towards selfish gain. It involves losing oneself, not building oneself. Um, and for the disciples, um, and if we're to understand this as tempting, for Jesus, there is this goal. Um, towards selfishness that exists and is going to entice people to follow the wrong type of Messiah. Um, we will get more into this as we get to the crucifixion, but that gap between expectations and reality is the type of thing that causes people to flee. It's the reason the disciples don't show out. It's the reason they're not hopeful the day after the crucifixion. It's the reason they're not looking forward to Jesus' resurrection. It's the reason that they have been told but not heard, which anybody who has ever spent time with children completely understands that struggle. Um, and I think it's important for us to recognize that even those who were with Jesus had that challenge. Maybe we shouldn't be surprised when we have the exact same one. But I think what that means for us is that it's important for us to take stock of Jesus on Jesus' terms versus the Jesus we've created on our terms and try to wrestle through some of the things that we think should be happening, um, especially when we suffer disappointment because they're not happening, uh, because it should cause us to step back and say, okay, am I creating Jesus in my own image? Am I following the Messiah that I want versus the Messiah as he was and is? And as we work through those things, I think we come to a better understanding of why it is okay to trust in a defeated Messiah. Um, because what Jesus essentially does is turn our understanding of victory and defeat on its head, if we're willing to understand Jesus on Jesus' terms. For the early church, that is certainly a challenge. There are you know, Jewish worshipers in the synagogues in the countryside away from Jerusalem who see these Jesus folks come in um, to their synagogues, uh, who have conversations with them, who cannot understand how they follow somebody who's crucified um, and how they could still continue to believe that that is any Messiah, but certainly the Messiah. Um, and so we get words of encouragement here from Peter, I mean, from Jesus to Peter and from Matthew to Matthew to us that it is worth trusting because it's where we will ultimately find our life in trusting Jesus as he is and not on our terms. All right. Glad that you were with us this evening or whenever it is that you take the time to watch this. We will pick it up in chapter 17 next week with the transfiguration. Um, where we get one of those rare actual um, 
timeline demarcations, which begins six days later. Matthew almost never does that, which means we should probably pay attention to its importance. All right, we will be back at it next week. Bye, all.